Hello everyone. As uh, usual, I do apologize for the sound. Several of the fans are on because of, you know, obvious reasons, really, when it comes down to it. Also, apparently my voice is still a little crackly from the uh, cough that I've had the last couple of days, but I kind of wanted to do this anyways. I've actually been putting it off um, <laughs> because of throat issues. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so hopefully... I can actually do so today. <clears throat> For anybody who's wondering, yes, this is the continuation of the D&D vlog. Uh, several people have asked if I was going to continue the live blog to its end and then the online blog or anything like that. The truth is the two are effectively the same campaign at this point in time. I'll really get into that later. <clears throat> Excuse me. The last we saw... Flux and Fear and Seal. They were on the island of Mary Lasselle, up on the plateau, having just encountered Berrigan, who was disintegrating at a magical level. Uh, actually, decohesing, I believe is the term I used for that. Now, they did went go ahead and fight him. Uh, this was actually the very last live session we ever had, was the fight against Berrigan, and that's it. It was like a 20-minute session. They did manage to be completely creeped out by him. He would, uh... Okay. For those of you who, have, who haven't remembered or don't really know what's going on here, Berrigan was a lycanthrope. He was one who was working for the Lady Airfall. Now, he was a wolf lycanthrope, and... During the battle periodically, he would shift and split into two beings. One would be this not quite solid wolf thing. Like, if you picture a, a wolf, right? Now picture you just remove chunks of the wolf and make it completely hollow. So it's like a, a shell of a wolf. And now remove, like, this chunk of his leg and this chunk of his body and this chunk of his neck until what you have is this just kind of halfway floating amalgamation of pieces that look like they could have been a shell of a wolf. So that was half of it. The other half was what was left, which was this kind of swirling jelly of energy, which they actually could not damage at all while it was like that, because any attack would simply just kind of go through it, including magical attacks. So it took some effort, but they did manage to... Basically, they, they found out during the course of the fight that there were these chains that were on Berrigan, now, these chains were of a substance of an energy type that they had basically only encountered the previous day. Uh, they had started referring to these as spiritual energy, basically for lack of another option. Once they successfully broke these chains, which required magical damage, Berrigan let out this horrifying cry of, finally, grabbed his own throat and ripped it out. Berrigan fell to the ground, and as he hit the ground, his entire body just completely disintegrated like he was made of water. Splash! and all the magical energy that made up his existence went everywhere. The party members were not happy about that. Um, and of course, from his remains, just in case anyone was wondering, yes, came eight little eight-sided crystals. Now, this, as I mentioned, that was the last live session per se. Of course, I do live near these people, and so you know, being able to talk to Fear Seal in person is something I uh, did actually have the capacity to do. So, what I would do is... Well, okay, then the online campaign got started, basically, is what I'm trying to say here. But there was a time variance, and at some point, uh, like a couple weeks after the online campaign had already been going for a bit now, Fear Seal said she would like to actually rejoin the campaign in the online format. And I said, sure. No problem. I'd actually kind of planned for that, to be completely honest with you. And she was like, okay, I can live with that. So, uh... Yeah, just a second. Therefore, I'm going to tell you what happened to her next. Then I'm going to skip over to the online campaign proper, okay? So she and, F and Flux went... Uh, okay, after they had broken the chains, they went further into the Sanctum. Now, I'm not going to describe it in full detail, uh, primarily because, if you recall, this entire island was very differently structured than Vasay and Lasselle. It was much smaller. 
they had farming equipment, or what, what the, the party assumed was farming equipment, farming land, everything set up in such a way so that they could um, properly uh, uh, farm a truly massive amount of material. In fact, they did some uh, estimations based on some rolls, and we're talking the kind of super efficient layered farms, the kind of thing we actually don't have the technology to do now in real life, to feed a few hundred million people, something like that, right? The inside of the sanctum was basically exactly that. It was clearly facilities and storage facilities, um, uh, packing facilities, you know, just basically everything that you would need in order to gather and then distribute massive quantities of food. So there really wasn't that much for them to do in this particular sanctum. It is also worth noting that there were still some uh, trials, just like there were in uh, the previous, like they were in the previous sanctums they've been through. Now, once they get about halfway through, which is, does not take long, obviously, they see a tumorock. Now, this was something that really kind of threw them, because they were not actually expecting, you know, to find anybody in here. The Tumorok looks up, and you know, to be honest with you, I actually don't remember what I named him. <laughs> it isn't necessarily relevant, so we're going to just name him Bim Jumbob. No, seriously, though, his name was like Tonkaya or something like that. Uh, it's not particularly relevant, but he, as they talked to him, he, they, were, he, they found out that he was something of an alchemist, and he <clears throat> had been experimenting with a particular brand of chemicals and a little bit of magic in order to reanimate bodies. A very, very, very crude form of necromancy. Hang on a second, that's very, that's very wrong. Oh, well, whatever. Now, for those of you who don't remember, the plateau had been overrun with various unpleasant things, and the party had already literally encountered a quote-unquote undead tumorock already. For those of you who have also been paying attention, you may remember that undead as a whole don't actually exist in this setting, at least not as they do in most fantasy settings in general. Indeed, even this is really not the undead. This is literally reanimated corpses. There's no soul there. You know, they are not undead. It's literally just the body is still moving. You follow me? Uh, a little more of the... Uh, you know, actually, I can't even come up with another example. I'm sure there's other things that do that, but you get where I'm going with this. So... They talk to him and try to, you know, are, are, basically try to talk him down. That fails completely. It's pretty clear this guy has completely lost his mind. He's been here a few years at this point, and he's just been experimenting on this. Apparently, he was actually banished up to the plateau for being a deviant by the other Tumorox. And upon doing so, he didn't take that very well and just kind of started going further nutso, especially when he discovered a way into the sanctum. He does talk about someone in a red cloak who came by and didn't actually acknowledge him so much as swept by him, but the experience changed his life. And ever since that happened, which was a few weeks prior to this event, he has just been frantically trying to improve his, po his, uh, his formula for his serum. Now... Just to make something clear, by the way, this is actually kind of important. All of this is happening. I do actually have my calendar in my hands right here. Yes, I keep a calendar. It's extremely helpful for keeping uh, track of what's going on when. This is all happening on January 14th, okay? That'll be important in a minute. So, they successfully defeat, you know, whatever the heck his name was. And in so defeating him, they believe that they've stopped whatever the problem was that was plaguing the Tumorox and causing all this undeath, not quite undeath, issuant. However, the moment they do, his body, which is just lying lifeless on the floor, gets yanked up like it's on a puppet string and yanked back further into the temple, screaming. They were like, okay. So they decide, somewhat hesitantly, to go ahead and go further in. They do not go very much farther before they come to a very large, very heavily enforced door, in front of which is, there's the body of What's-His-Face, and another Tumorok, except this Tumorok looks odd. He doesn't move right, he doesn't talk right, he doesn't look right. As they talk to him, they find out that he was once called the Godbreaker. I say he was once called. This was a Tumorok of innate, immense, natural power. Um... 
Fiona Seal rather correctly guessed that this was probably a violet mage back when, well, I'll get to it. But this person was someone of such tremendous threat, and he, well, he was psychotically evil, let's just put it that way. And he had delusions of grandeur. He really, well, I shouldn't even say delusions. He was a violet mage. He had ambitions of grandeur. He had every intent to spread and crush and rule. And he opposed the, uh, the scion race, which, if you're thinking about this, yes, that means this guy is several centuries old, or at least was. I'll get to it. The bottom line is what they are stirring at is actually only a piece of the Godbreaker that was left. What they did was be, it, it was so difficult to destroy this individual that all they had been able to do at the time was sever his soul from his body and destroy that. But, well, this is like I said, this is kind of the player's and you, the viewer's first introduction to Violet Mages proper. He was so powerful that his body kept going without his soul. Now, it didn't have much to drive it, but it did actually continue to function for a while there and managed to defeat many of the Scions who had been sent to just defeat him until, for some reason, the Scions just kind of vanished. We've talked about that before, the Cataclysm, so to speak. So, sorry, I have people talking to me. They engage in this truly epic battle, all right? And I mention that because, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, most of the boss fights to date have only been lasting eh, about 10-ish rounds. Now that's a good decent period of time in D&D, all things considered. But this battle was brutal. They literally barely, barely bring this guy down. He also, uh, by the way, reanimates not just uh, our, our friend from earlier, our alchemist friend, but also several spirits of Scions and several spirits of Tumrox as well. He just brings it all up and flings it at them, and he himself is just crushing the hell out of them. They do manage to beat him, um, just barely, literally just barely. They're out of mana, they're out of psi points in her case. Health are basically screwed completely. And uh, they, they finally manage to break down the Godbreaker. He explodes. All his energy goes away. From both him and the previous individual, the Alchemist, uh, finally, several of those eight-sided sto stones show up. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. You're starting to see a pattern. I just keep mentioning it to keep reminding you of it. That it it'll come into play at some point, I hope. I hope at some point the players will figure it out, because they actually haven't yet, uh, even at the point at which we are at now in the online campaign. But anyways, moving along. With the Godbreaker defeated, they're like, okay, we desperately need to rest, but I gotta know what's behind that door. So they go ahead and open the door, and this massive door opens, and they find themselves in an interesting facility. For all intents and purposes, this place is a completely user-friendly knowledge base. It has a tremendous reservoir of information about the Scions, about the, everything about them, about everything that happened there with and there too. Honestly, I'm actually not going to share what Fearnasil learned here. Not yet. But Fearnasil, I basically t took the player and I said, okay, you can basically ask me any question. I will give you some defaults because I assume you want to know blah, blah, blah. But everything else you can ask, and you can ask it basically anything, and we spent quite a while as she just kind of asked and asked and asked. It was really cool. And um, there is one piece of information she learned that I am going to share with you, and certain Asheron's call players are going to make fun of me, and I really don't care. They learned that the Red Cloak that they've been having difficulties with this entire time was named Gerlin, the Gold Lord. After this massive information dump, they also found an obsidian shard. It was actually several obsidian shards that had been clunked together, right, in uh, in pieces. And they assumed, quite naturally, that this is the artifact that the Lady Airfall sent them to get. So they go ahead and both grab it, and then they pass out. Now, I could describe to you exactly what Fearnasil saw there, but again, I'm not going to, not yet. Give me just a moment, I'm sorry.
Now, we're going to cut over to the online player's game. I've described my setting in brief, in very brief, actually, so you'll forgive me, but actually, you know what, we're at 15 minutes. I'm going to go ahead and basically try and describe more of my setting as best as I can, okay? Because basically, you guys haven't really encountered it yet. <sighs> I'm trying to think of where to begin. <laughs> okay. The continent of Dareth is well established within well okay you know what you know what I've, I've changed my mind completely screw it I'm sorry but you guys can discover it as I go through the campaign so let's just let's just skip forward a lot the way the online campaign started was every single member of the online group was a member of the adventurers guild now the adventurers guild has been declining in both popularity prestige and operation uh, basically for the last several decades. It's basically becoming obsolete. Too many large-scale problems can be dealt with by the military or by mercenary corp corporations or companies, which have been can becoming very popular lately, by the way. Or the small-scale stuff, which can be dealt with by uh, guardians or by, again, the local military or the local militia. So, in general, adventuring has been very much on the downswing. I mention that because that's actually a very important point for this setting. Unlike, say, Faerun or Eberron, both of which where adventuring is literally the profession that the entire economy sets on, and at least I've heard it argued, and I would argue that myself, in here, adventuring is the exception, the rarity. Very few people actually choose to adventure. Most people choose to do other things. Now... The guild itself is barely functioning, so anytime they get a large-scale bill, which is what they call them, you know, an adventuring bill, they make a point of really spreading the information about that. Now, there is no internet, they're not that technologically advanced or anything like that. What they, they do have a postal service, which is very efficient, and all of the major cities, with some exceptions, are connected one to another by this thing called the hub. The hub is an artifact from whatever came before. Now, you, the viewers, can probably surmise that this was the Psionic Empire. But the point being, this hub is something that, within the last uh, 50 years or so, the mites have figured out how to reverse engineer to an extent. Oh, I shouldn't say reverse engineer, that's the wrong term. They've figured out how to function it. They've figured out how to make it work. And so the a very large portion of mites... Uh, that's a species, by the way. Uh, very short, uh, fox-like looking creatures. Very intelligent. Fiercely intelligent. Um, the mites have been running the hub ever since, and for a fairly small fee, you can use the hub to go anywhere you have a visa to go to. There are four nations, so naturally you do have to have a visa to go to Alluvia, to Navere, to the show, or to the Osteth. Just makes sense, right? In any case, Information was spread wi wide and far because this rather large bill came in for 10,000 gold, which is quite a bit for the Adventurer's Guild. The bill was very simple, uh, and I'll describe it in more detail when I actually get to the proper moment, but effectively it had to do with some null problems. Really quick, I want to describe something. There are very, very few races in my setting that are the same as races in other D&D settings. So, gnolls, kobolds, etc. are are not, you know, always evil, are not always stupid or anything like that. They are uh, just another race. They're intelligent, they're sentient, etc., etc. So, try not to, to get any misconceptions going there. For example, uh, the orcs are actually one of the most common average races, uh, as are the elves. And, of course, if you've been paying attention, you know that there are basically no humans. So, when we start the online campaign, I made the mistake of letting people play whatever they wanted. I say that was a mistake. It was a mistake at the time. It has since been rectified. I've since managed to make it work. But at the time, I was really irritated because two players really wanted to play humans, and I'm just staring at them like, uh, okay. Um, I, I let it happen. Uh, one guy wanted to play a Sklavi, one guy wanted to play uh, a Burun, etc., etc. One guy wanted to play a Lugian. <laughs> One guy wanted to play a gnome. And so forth and so on. I keep going, but you get the general point. The human problem was that I... 
I really had to work out how humans could get to this setting and do anything uh, with anything. So the human problem is why I set the date as it is. The online campaign effect actually begins January 21st. If you're paying attention, that is exactly one week after uh, Fear Nasil and Flux basically disappeared. So Fear Nasil and Flux show up the 13th. That's when their ship shows up. The ship gets repaired the 16th. It starts making regular runs back and forth between Holtberg and Visay and Lasalle. One of our human players was a stowaway on a ship. It's actually kind of complicated. I don't want to give. I don't want to give away anything. That's kind of his story. But nevertheless, the point is, he wasn't. I shouldn't say stowaway. I'm sorry. I'm getting this wrong. One of the human players was a stowaway on their ship, so he showed up when they did. One of the human players, the other, the other human player, there are only two, was someone who was kidnapped as a result of being involved in a scuffle. It's kind of complicated, but the long and short of it is a bunch of people were panicking because the Vasay and Lasalle was disintegrating from underneath them, took a ship, and went out with it. Uh, I, sh I don't want to say too much more, but let's just say that Rory, uh, that's the person involved here, basically was one of the only survivors, if not the only survivor of that kerfuffle, because this is a ship that was never intended to sail the seas, being taken by a bunch of people who are not sailors. I don't think I have to tell you what a recipe for disaster that is. So, uh, with the human problem fixed and the, the timeline established, on January 21st, the entire party congregates in the town... Oh, my goodness. Hang on a second. In the town of My Neck Hurts. <laughs> uh, you know, I should just have the map up for this as well. Give me just a moment. I've been doing a lot of work on this damn map. It is uh, extensive. There we go. Okay. And the town of Al Erat, which is in the Al Jalima state of the Navarri Confederacy. They hear the overall terms of the bill. Now, I'm basically going to stop uh, semi soon here. I kind of wanted to get at least most of the first adventure out, though. The problem is that gnolls have been attacking the outskirts of Alirat. Alirat is something of a trade post slash farming post. It's one of the biggest exporters of dates and figs in the entire region. And the gnolls have been attacking some of the outlying farms, which aren't very well defended because the local militia has been pulled in thanks to threat of war from the show. For those of you who, are, who do not remember... War between the Shou Empire and the Navarri Confederacy is at this point so close to breaking out that literally everybody is anticipating it happening any day now, which is really screwing everybody up. For those of you who do not truly understand the significance of this, let me also add that there has never been war in the recorded history of this setting. Now, for those of you who don't understand the significance of that, recorded history only goes back 349 years. The year zero is when recorded history begins. Now, everybody knows, to some extent or another, that his that stuff happened before that, right? There was a time before recorded history, but nobody's entirely certain what or where or how. The only ones who were around uh, prior to that time that we know of were the Derekost and the Order. I'll get to them later. I just mentioned that because in the last 349 years, there's never been war. And nobody really knows how to take this. A little over 30 years ago, I'm sorry, I, I keep going into this because I really want you guys to get the point of this. A little over 30 years ago, a group called, the, calling themselves the Tumorox, uh came out of absolutely nowhere, invaded a huge chunk of land, and in the space of three days, completely and utterly conquered it. Three days. Now, to give you a little bit of an idea of how large this chunk of territory is, Imagine a, an area the size of two Texases combined. That's about the size of the zone they conquered in three days. Now, the nations that lost territory there and were crushed by them were completely unprepared for this. Even when they started fighting back, it was completely useless. Um, one of the things I said to really emphasize this point to the players is that there are no veterans of the Dry Reach Affair because nobody fought them and lived. There were no survivors. 
there were only the people who happened to not engage them because for whatever reason they stopped they they conquered out to a certain point and then they just stopped now that's important because I'm being called oh my god are you kidding me okay bad wrong number or something anyways <laughs> sorry about that um where the hell was I that really threw me the the reason this is relevant is because that is why there basically is so strong of a military presence in the modern era. There really wasn't up until this point. There hadn't really been a need for it. I mean, obviously, there were such a thing as military. There was such a thing as uh, armed forces and whatnot. But at this point in time, they decided to start really collaborating the... Lugians and the gnomes and the mites uh, across several nations all kind of coordinated efforts in order to reverse engineer several ships that they had found in ruins from you know whoever came before and they successfully managed to figure out exactly how to get them working sort of and make their own weaker versions of them this is where airships came into the play airships are still fairly new obviously in the last 30 years like I mentioned and they are well i've i've described airships in to, to the online group in some detail but they are basically super weapons for all intents and purposes this is one of the reasons why there's not very many of them they're all incredibly difficult to make they take an incredible amount of time etc cetera, etc cetera. airships in this setting uh have both mundane and magical weaponry and they have a tremendous amount of durability they're primarily designed not to fight other airships, but to fight ground targets. They also have uh, ridiculously complicated scanning facilities. Like, they can actually, for example, scan and tell... We, uh, it's a, an airship flying by, if it wanted to, could scan you and tell exactly what you have equipped, how much air you're breathing, what your height is, what your weight is, that sort of detail, right? Similarly, airships also have the availability to run silent, and, and and all sorts of other things like that. Now they are of course very very expensive to build, maintain, etc. It requires all sorts of training, large crews. But airships are the weapons of the modern age. Sorry, I just really wanted to get that point out as well. Airships have never actually been used in large scale conflict yet, not counting two exceptions. Uh, well, I shouldn't say conflict. Ha airships haven't been used for any major engagement, whether it be military or otherwise, except for two exceptions. One. About a decade ago, a fairly large airship fleet, which was a combination fleet of several of the nations, was sent east to the hidden continent, uh, Aburian, which nobody had ever actually returned from. You may or may not be surprised to know that those airships have never returned. The second was a rather large attempt was made to attack Dry Reach, basically, to, to go after them. Uh, those, uh, there were no survivors, I'll just put it frankly. They have all, there have also been several smaller attempts trying to sneak people into Dry Rage, trying to get individuals in there, uh, trying to get a single ship in. No survivors. It's never happened. So, now that we've established that a little bit, the concept of war, as I was mentioning earlier, is very, very terrifying to the general populace especially, because, as I mentioned, they've basically never seen something like this. The Dry Rage thing was bad enough, War is different. War is not, you know, some ancient power or whatever the Tomb Rocks are came in and, and stomped us all. War is a legitimate grievance between two nations which stretch across cont uh, you know, a continent and wish to bring that to bear by conflict with each other, one another. All of that, my goodness, all of that was just backdrop to tr truly explain the mentality of the people here. These people are genuinely terrified, and so the uh, the gentleman who is in charge of the Al-Jalim estate, whose name I'm going to look up in a moment here, has basically in ordered all militia, all local forces, all local military within any given towns within the entire state to withdraw to protect the town itself. This is true for, of course, Alarad as well. Toltarn, Toltarn of Amani, that's his name, he's a troll. And a very well-liked guy, actually. <clears throat> Excuse me. And somebody is making noise out there. Now, as you might imagine, I've put a lot of thought and effort into the setting and the details and the politics and the culture and the relations thereof. 
I can't possibly get all of that across uh, within such a summarized format, but I'm going to do my best so you guys can at least understand where I'm going with things. However, I do want to discuss something else rather briefly because it'll be relevant soon. The politics within the Neveri are very strange. You see, all of the people... Uh, all of the leaders, uh, the mayors, the uh, region, the state governors, the regional leaders, all that stuff, all are elected by popular vote, right? And I do mean by popular vote, a, a democratic vote, not a republic or representative vote that's important. The catch is, well, okay, see, they can be, rep there, are no, there are no terms. They are not elected for a term. They are not elected to be in charge for a blah period of time. They are elected until they are replaced or they sit, step down, one of the two, or die, or, you know, whatever. The interesting catch is the leaders basically do wield absolute power, uh, more or less complete absolute power. They have total authority, right? But they always have to be careful when using that total authority because in if they do so in a way that people do not care for, they can and indeed will be replaced. You follow me so far? So, in other words, it is the job of the leadership of these, of these people to not just take care of things, but to make sure that they are staying popular. <laughs> now that I've got all that out of the way, <laughs> my goodness... So the first adventure, they, the, the party gathers up, and they find out that these gnolls are attacking Alderaan. The military has been pulled back into the city, so they're not doing anything about the gnoll threat. The local mayor is basically inaccessible. He is someone who is really losing popularity with the locals, and is probably going to be replaced sometime soon, just because of the way things work. Even though he is a very efficient leader, and he has been making sure that al Arat has been prospering, Nevertheless, he is so inaccessible and so non-public that the people don't like that. They want a leader they can talk to. They want a leader they can walk up to and, and just say, hey, yo. Now, there is another guy. <sighs> I, I'm sorry, I really don't remember the names. I do apologize. But there's another individual that they do have a line on, basically, who they want to take over. He's a local merchant. He is very accessible. He's he's a very wealthy merchant. He's made a huge amount of money uh, on the Dayton fig trade. But despite his wealth and station, he actually keeps his own stall in the middle of the bazaar. And he just kind of hangs out and talks with people. So as you might imagine, he's much more popular. The party immediately splits up, <laughs> which was something I wasn't actually expecting. It was kind of funny. And starts investigating the different areas and whatnot. One of the party groups goes out towards the fields to, you know, talk to the farmland people and see what's going on out there. One of the groups goes and tries to talk to the local guardian, who I haven't mentioned yet. I'll get to him in just a second. One of the groups tries to talk to the mayor. The group that tries to talk to the mayor basically runs into a brick wall. They don't get basically anything from him at all. All they learn is everything I've just told you in in a nutshell. All the politics going on, the fact that he's probably going to be gone soon, the fact that he's almost never accessible. There's a line, a huge line of people trying to see him, and that line has, has been there. You know, some of those people have been there for a couple of days at this point. That kind of a thing. The people who go to the Guardian... Now, okay, a Guardian is someone who is hired by the locals, by the people. This is true across all four nations, by the way who is basically in charge of taking care of anything that might threaten the town that the military won't take care of. It, generally what you would consider small-scale stuff. A single bandit group, or beasts, or other wild animals, monsters, that kind of a thing. Anything of that nature is something a guardian would take care of. Um, a guardian... <coughs> excuse me. Now, a guardian's salary is, of course, dependent on whether or not the people are willing to pay him for doing his or her job. But, in general, there is uh, considered to be a courtesy payment that is given to the Guardian, even if, you know, the town hasn't been in trouble lately, so that the Guardian stays there for when the town is in trouble. That's not always true. That's one of those unwritten rule kind of things, so just thought I'd mention it. In this case, this guy is uh, named Harkin. It's one of the only names I remember from this adventure. Harkin is an orc, a orc with a really awesome red hat and uh, flamboyant red robes, and he is very charismatic, very excellent in his speech and mannerisms. He likes to talk his way through situations, etc., etc. He is a former adventurer who retired to, be, to become a guardian here. 
he has been taking care of the Null situation to the best of his ability. However, he is also the one who put out the bill. Now, the bill is to take out the Nulls. Uh, the estimate is there's going to be 20 or 30 of them, something like that, to just find wherever their camp is, like, nearby, and just wipe them out. Because it is his belief that, even though he has been taking care of the situation thus far, he hasn't been taking care of it well enough. You know what I mean? And at some point or another, he's going to slip, or they're going to miss something, and then someone's going to get hurt. So he went ahead and put forth the bill with a fairly large amount of gold attached to it. I mentioned earlier, 10,000, and said, here, take care of the nulls, finish them off. Uh, he, when they encounter him, he is somewhat obstinate. They, uh, the party tries to insist upon him assisting them, or them assisting him, rather, going out in one of his patrols, he says flat no. And there's absolutely nothing they do that changes his mind. So finally, they leave and dis and have a very, very bad opinion of this guy. They decide, well, he's evil, he's corrupt, he's in on this, etc., etc. The third group, there was actually a fourth group, I just don't actually... Yeah, anyways, the other group heads out to the fields and finds something out rather suspicious that nobody else has mentioned thus far. They discover that the gnolls who have been attacking have been going very far out of their way to ensure that there are no casualties. They will never hurt someone. They will, you know, <clears throat> burn crops or a building or whatever, but they will never actually come after someone. They find this rather suspicious, and they do also... F uh, they get two rumors while they're out there. Actually, they get like ten rumors, but I'm only going to tell you two of them. <clears throat> because... <clears throat> because my voice is kind of going out. Whoa. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, hang on a second. Alright, I, I do apologize. Wow. So there's two rumors they decide to follow up on. One, they hear that a man had seen centaurs in the area, which is really bizarre. And two, they, f they hear that the gnolls have all been coming from a nearby ruin. <coughs> Excuse me, a ravine, not a ruin. My goodness, I apologize. Didn't think my throat would be giving me this many issues today. <sighs> Alright, so... They decide to go, they talk to the old man, and he basically tells them there's no way he actually saw centaurs. He's already convinced himself he hasn't. If he had actually seen centaurs, they would have heard about it. Now, in this setting, centaurs are very much maligned. They are still sentient, they are still intelligent, but the vast majority of centaurs, or at least the centaurs that people encounter, are vicious, bloodthirsty, they really... I shouldn't even say vicious and bloodthirsty, that's not really the way to put it. They are incredibly anti-magic and anti-technology. Uh, as part of their culture, as part of their belief system. And so as a resultant, you might imagine, they really don't like anybody else. And so they will stage raids and attacks on people, not to steal their stuff, but because they're actually trying to destroy. They're, they're, they're actively trying to destroy whatever it is they find there because, you know, it's magical or technological. Or both, as the case may be. So... He insists that he could not have possibly seen centaurs, and his reason why is actually really simple. If he had, they would have known about it. You know, he saw this like a couple days ago. If there were centaurs in the area, there would have been word of some kind of attack, or caravans being missing, or something. But there's been nothing. The party really grinds this guy, but he just says... He, there's nothing else he has to tell them. He thought he saw centaurs one night. Obviously, he probably just saw a horse or something. So they get nothing from that. They then decide to follow up on the ravine thing, and sure enough, as they're approach on their approach to the ravine, they find a null scout. They uh, attempt to... <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pause for a second. I want to say something. I'm, the online party, of course, has lots and lots of role-playing because it's a large group, so there's a lot of inter-party interactions. I'm not going to be really talking about that or detailing it, even though it is awesome and one of the things I like about the online group. Uh, because there's no way in hell I could ever actually do that without just going down the forums and reading. And then he said, and then she said, and I don't really feel like doing that. This is a summary. Nevertheless, I will be summarizing certain actions on the part of the, part of the, part of the party members. <laughs> With that out of the way, so they encounter a null scout who then goes, yep, and runs off to 
report to wherever. They try to disable him and end up killing him. Raver ends up killing him, a lycanthrope in the party. Now, they aren't entirely sure what to do about this. Raver, however, feels really, really bad about this. And so when they approach the ravine, Raver decides to howl at the top of his lungs. Uh, one of the things I've mentioned before is I'll always let my D&D players do whatever they choose to as long as they're willing to accept consequences. That's basically how it works for me as a GM. The rule of consequence. That's the only rule that really exists for me. Uh, everything else in the book, all that stuff, is there, of course, as a guideline. But when it comes to the end of the day, what defines what you can do is what you, what's on your character sheet and are you willing to accept the consequences of your actions. He was, of course, so he howls, and the party members are like, oh my god, and several of them go hiding, and as you might imagine, a bunch of gnolls come out. They literally barely, barely manage to stay hidden from these gnolls. They do ha the gnolls, however, do find the corpse uh, of their scout. They immediately take it up with them with reverence, I might add. They do carefully grab the corpse and take it carefully back down into the ravine with them. So... That changes several of the party members' minds about things. I don't remember exactly how the next events happen, but Raver then does something else, like yells uh, or shouts or otherwise howls again, gets their attention again, and the gnolls come chasing after him. Uh, about 20 of them. Raver and whoever went with him then go running off. Basically, just running off. They, they go fleeing. The gnolls go chasing after them, after a fairly long chase, they finally give up. So Raver goes back to town where the other rest of the adventuring party is waiting. Now, by the way, just to make this clear, this party has never actually encountered each other before. This is all just random adventurers. I just mention that because, you know, any interactions or any friendships or any dynamics between the party members has developed over the course of the campaign. None of it has is pre-existing. He goes back and says, oh my god, we, we, we found the gnolls, we gotta go. Now, the rest of the party members basically haven't really found out anything of circumstance other than the fact that they believe the entire situation is very fishy. You know, the, the militia has been brought in. The local uh, leader of the militia is the local marshal. Uh, no, no, the co local const constable is basically useless. The mayor refuses to talk to anybody, etc., etc. So that's all they've really learned. Oh, and Harkin, they believe, is corrupt. They all rush out after the gnolls. Now... The entire party is now at the ravine. I want to describe the ravine in brief. I tried on the forums, and I kind of failed. I kind of, I actually had to do up a picture to really describe this. They're, they're at ground level, right? Now, the ravine goes down from there. You follow me? So, at ground level, the ravine uh, begins and then cuts down about, I believe I decided, 110 feet down. At the base of the ravine is the river, which is which has created this ravine, this this chasm, this cliff, whatever you want to call it, and there is a obviously uh, manufactured staircase cut into one of the cliff faces going down the ravine. So someone from the ground level could make their way down into the ravine going along this staircase. Uh, it would be difficult to. It, it's not the most sturdy staircase in the world, and it would take some time and effort, uh, especially if you want to stay hidden or if you're in a hurry. But nevertheless, that's how you get down. The party spent considerable time there. You know, like, oh god, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do, debating what to do. Finally, Raver yells something else again, <laughs> basically saying, I have done it, I killed your person, come after me, something along those lines. Uh, no response. No response. So... Finally, they decide, okay, we're going to we're gonna send some people down. So they send a few of their people who are good at sneaking and talking. That small group makes their way down the staircase, and they find a door built into the cliff face. Now, to try and describe this as best as I can, again, picture the ravine. It goes down. Two, uh, you know, two cliff faces on both sides, obviously, uh, on either side of the river. The river itself is quite large. So we're talking, uh, I'd say, at least 70 feet from, from wall to wall from cliff to cliff, I should say. On the side that they're going down with the staircase, there's a door that leads into the cliff face, and once they open it, there's a rather large facility there. That facility uh, goes in and around some ways. In other words, it's built un completely underground. Do you follow me? 
Now, this whole the area is actually really well hidden, all things considered. Nobody has, uh, nobody has ever reported seeing anything here. Uh, the staircase itself is actually quite well hidden. They wouldn't have even seen it, if not for the fact that the gnolls had been using it, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and from the ground level, if you're just walking around, you wouldn't have seen any of this. But they, So they go in through the door. There are th uh, three doorways leading out. There's one leading to the w left, which is north, and one leading to the right, which is south. They decide to go through the one to the right. The very first thing they encounter is a bunch of kobolds. They immediately draw weapons and are ready to fight the team, and the team's like, whoa, 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 peace, peace, guys. And the kobolds look at you and say, uh, well, okay. <laughs> I, again, I don't want to summarize dialogue, but in essence, the kobolds insist that these are the destroyers that the gnolls have warned them about, and that now they have to defend their home from the destroyers who are coming to take it out. Now, they try to talk their way through the kobolds and eventually learn that the kobolds have been here for several decades. Somewhere during this process, by the way, they bring the rest of the party down. So the entire party is now down within this uh, facility, within this uh, construct, home, whatever you want to call it, burrow. They find out that the kobolds have been here for some time. They came here basically looking for a place to live in complete segregation from the rest of the world. Now, several of the party members bring up the rather obvious question, how could you possibly survive, let alone thrive down here? And they reveal that in their travels many, many, many years ago, you know, decades ago, they encountered a life elemental. Now, this life elemental basically bonded with their matriarch, Slavina, whose name I actually do remember. And Slavina ended up making something of a deal with the, the creature. They would take care of it, and it would take care of them. Very, uh, very symbiotic thing. And so when they finally found this place and built this whole thing, with, you know, literally with their bare hands, basically, and the tools they had available, uh, the life elemental helps them by giving them, you know, food and crops and good harvest season, that kind of a thing, and helps heal them when they have injuries. And they, of course, take care of it in return, which is a little more complicated, but suffice it to say that they do. Uh, no sacrifices or anything like that, nothing bad. It's just, you know, they celebrate life, they have life, and the life elemental, for some reason, likes that. So they talk to Slavina, and they basically find out all this information, and they're like, okay, sure, uh, I guess we'll uh, stop bothering you then. By the way, for anybody who is in part of the online group, yes, I know I'm actually kind of screwing up the order of events a little bit. My memory isn't that perfect, give me a break. The party then decides, okay, we need to go, we need to resolve this null thing. I mean, that is our job, right? Resolving the null thing. So they had, oh, oh, and by the way, one of the other things they find out is the gnolls had been basically hostile to the kobolds uh, until very recently, in fact, until today, and, actually, no, I'm sorry, until, until yesterday, no, no, yeah, it was today, it was today, my bad, it was today. Apparently, the gnolls had discovered that someone had put out a hit on them, the bill I mentioned, and, re and basically realized that the situation was bad, just made peace with the kobolds, made a very good uh, offering with them. And basically, the two have been working together for the day. I know that doesn't sound like a long period of time. But the gnolls are packing up. The gnolls are literally packing all of their things to leave. The gnolls have only been here about a week, by the way. They also learn that there's not 20 or 30 gnolls. There's more like 150 of them. It's a whole tribe. And they were being sent to kill 150 gnolls, assuming they even could. Which is debatable. So... They go the other way to try and interact with the gnolls, and they decide to be really, really, really cautious. I insisted the players actively describe how they were approaching things, what tonality what they were using, what their body posture was, because all of this was going to be factored in on exactly how this initial encounter would go. After a while, they decide to knock. That's the approach they decide. They're going to knock on one of the doors where they have been spying on the gnolls. They knock on the door. The gnolls are like, okay, hello. And after some lots of diplomacy rolls and, and char charisma rolls, they basically say, Hey, uh, can we talk to your leader, please? And the gnolls are like, Okay. Now, if I haven't described this whole situation properly yet, uh, those two doors initially that go north and south, they lead into long hallways. These hallways have are, are braced on the left side, uh, in this case, by the cliff wall, if you follow me. So, you know, just wall on that side. On the right side, there are several doors, which then go out into the rest of the uh, areas that this facility is made into. 
So they're standing there in the hallway, waiting, when one of the other doors further down in the hall bursts open and a huge, ten-foot-tall knoll stomps out. And this knoll is completely armored, has this massive flail with spikes on the end of it, and a huge shield. He is very intimidating looking, and the party immediately goes, oh god, we're dead. <laughs> Now he stomps forward and basically demands to know what they want with Nabone. Ah, which is his name, by the way. Nabone of the Wild Paw, I believe. Or no, that's not right. Wait a minute. Hang on just a second. I can't believe I've actually forgotten the clan name. Clan names are actually really important in this setting. Yeah, it's Wild Paw. I was right. I'll talk about clan names later because it becomes more and more important as the. So it's the story unfolds. So, Nabone is like, okay, what the hell do you want? He is very angry. He is very antagonistic. He's actually roaring at the top of his lungs. He, he smashes the wall as he's talking. They learn piecemeal from him that he and his tribe had entered into a magical contract with uh, somebody <laughs> named Harkin, an orc, in order to harass the local farmland and in so doing he would be able to get his job as a guardian here he would be able to justify it and they would be granted landship now that seems really odd and so they wonder you know what the heck i mean what do gnolls want with land they finally it takes a while this is this very very nearly became a fight uh several times they the party somehow managed to talk their way through this lots of good roles and lots of good uh, dialogue Basically, the Wild Paw... Okay. This is not all the Wild Paw. A clan in this setting... I'm just going to say this really briefly. A clan in this setting is basically the same as a last name. Uh, you'll notice, basically, no one ever uses last names unless they're adventurers. Adventurers do it specifically to distinguish themselves from their clan. So, a clan is huge. We're talking millions or tens of millions of people make up a clan, right? So the the connection is somewhat vague at this point in time. There are still obviously very important reasons, and there's a reason why everyone will identify themselves as I am blank of blank, with the second name being their clan name. But the, it's not the familial relationship of what most people assume clans are. With that out of the way, a tribe is almost always a specific family group within a clan. You follow me? Nabone took his tribe of the Wild Paw, which is what the ones are here are, the ones that are here, and basically left Stonehold. Now I haven't described Stonehold too much, and I'm only going to describe it in brief. Stonehold is where the, and you can't see it, but I'm doing air quotes here, the uncivilized races are. The goblins, the kobolds, the gnolls, the centaurs, and the mosswarts are all up there in Stonehold. They have a very, very, very loose confederation going on. Uh, basically, for all intents and purposes, it's not actually one power. It's more like it's a few dozen different powers that happen to coordinate whenever they have to deal with the outside world. Nobody in the Four Nations, well, I say on a political level, really cares for Stonehold and vice versa. Nabone reveals that his wild paw, which have quite a reputation as being extremely good warriors in the in uh, amongst the gnolls, were tired of being used as basically enforcers and brutes by the goblins. So he and his tribe left Stonehold, just abandoned it flat, and came to the south to try and find some way to live a different kind of life. And one of the types of lives that really appealed to most of his people was the idea of just finding some farmland and settling in, right? That's their motivation. Now, obviously they're not completely innocent in this matter, but they were doing all of this for the int 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 intent purpose of being able to settle somewhere within the Deveri, because Harkin promised that he would use his influence in order to get them some settling rights. So, with all that figured out, they're like, okay, sure. Now, I actually kind of gave this one to the players, because I kind of had to, because <laughs> I didn't want them to die. But I basically said, you intuit that uh, they were going to send one person back. I believe it was Raver, actually. Uh, or maybe it was Tavern. Both are lycanthropes. No relation. Um, they were going to send one player back to town to inform everyone what's going on and keep them up to date and blah, 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 blah. 
I basically said, you intuit that would be a very dangerous idea, and I believe that's all I actually said on the matter. They decided to go ahead and try and figure out what's going on based on that, so they sent their the only rogue in the party out to sneak his way up the staircase. And uh, as he's doing so, I'm like, okay. Zeiss, would you like to burn an AP on this roll? And he's just like, uh... Long story short, given the where the sun was at the moment, what he discovers is twofold. One, there are traps all of a sudden on the staircase that were not there before. Two, there are figures at the top of the ravine that were not there before. Now, by great fortune, they do not see him, and he has to sneak his way back down, which he manages barely, at which point he's like, okay, guys, we have a situation. Now, they'd have no idea who those people are, what they want, why the traps are there, etc., etc., etc. <sighs> After a great deal of discussion and, and trying to figure out what the heck they should do, they finally come across the idea that they should go ask Slavina if she knows of any way to help. Slavina actually does have an, an idea. She says they should try and contact the life elemental because she believes the life elemental would be able to do a kind of pseudo-teleport thing to get them to the surface. The way it works is there's actually a tree which is actually on the surface whose roots reach all the way down the 110-ish feet or so down to the down to the, this facility. I keep calling it a facility. I really don't want it. Domicile. There we go. That's what I want to call it. To this domicile. And the life elemental could probably push them through that through those roots, through the tree, you know, through the life, in other words, up into the surface. And I did this whole description of what the transit was like, which I unfortunately will not bore you with because I don't remember it. You know, actually, you know, I'm going to look it up. Give me just a moment. This shouldn't take long. I do have archives for all this stuff, after all. First adventure. Ah, oh, excuse me. It would have been right about here. So they get to the root. Here we go. <clears throat> As your hand touches the root, you feel this sudden immersive energy shooting through your entire body, ripping through you as though you are suddenly s a stick lost in the tide. There is no pain, no discomfort, merely an amazing sense of wonder that it takes you a moment to realize is not directly coming from yourself, although the sensation is infectious. You can neither see, hear, nor feel, and after a moment you realize you don't physically exist anymore. Just as the horror of that thought begins to settle and you find yourself standing, quite serenely, in the setting sun up by a very large tree. Now, what happened thereafter is they are now up on the surface, uh, about 50 feet away from where the ravine entrance was. And, like, okay, now what? And they look over and they see, surprise, surprise, there is a large number of centaurs standing around the ravine with bows and crossbows at the ready, basically ready to shoot anyone who comes up the staircase. The only one who does not have a weapon thusly ready is someone who is holding a large staff, uh, who is also draped in some armor that the others aren't. This was actually a really awesome battle, because the party barely beat him. Uh, beat them. I use, uh, you know how I do my boss fights at this point in time. You know, there's a boss, and then there's, if there's trash, they're basically minions. There were a grand total of eight minions in this fight, which it took the party some time to bring down. And the boss himself, who... Every every boss I do has what I call an enrage timer. Uh, I shouldn't still call it a timer, because that's an inaccurate term. An enrage trigger. Uh, it literally depends on the individual and the circumstances, but Araguna manages to get a really awesome shot, which pierces the, the boss's hand, uh, disabling him and making it so he can no longer use his weapons. That actually happened to be his enrage trigger. So he enrages right at the beginning of the fight. Begins using all of his big, most powerful attacks right off the start. And very, 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 very nearly takes out the party. He manages to down several individuals. That does not mean kill. Uh, I, it's a separate status effect I use within my setting. Um, but yeah, he manages to put several people into downed. They finally defeat him. When he finally calls forth this massive suicide attack, kills himself, nearly kills several people around him in the process. And his body solidifies, like petrifies, and then crumbles into clumps of clay and earth onto the ground. 
Now I'm actually going to stop here, because I'm already an hour in. I didn't think that would be uh, quite this long. We're not quite done with the first adventure yet, but I think that's a good stopping point. So we will continue with the D&D blog at some point in the future. At which point I will see you.